Rocking chair, chair sessions. sessions. With Elisa Di Battista, Maria Teresa Barber. Hi everyone and welcome to Rocking Chair Sessions. Hello everyone for I think it's RCS volume 22. 22. With our special guest Lauren Shapiro. Hello. Hi Lauren. <laughs> welcome. Happy welcome to, to the here. Rocking Chair. Thank you. <laughs> We're excited to have you. We've had to reschedule you from your trip to um, Art Basel. Yes. Um, and now you are here with us so hooray. Um, I guess I wanted to jump in because last time I had we to have translate. To give, we have to give the listeners a little bit of, of background. background on this. So we are recording these sessions in Miami at the Bake House, right? And if you've watched the news at any point in the last week or so, you know that there is a huge major Category 5 hurricane coming towards us. Called Irma. So we are pre-recording this session with Lauren, and we are hoping for everyone that you guys are going to be safe. and um, Early release on Friday. We are going to release the audio earlier to probably calm you down during the hurricane or before the hurricane. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to see you guys on the other side. So okay. yeah. this is a little background to this special session. Yes. Okay. Well, I wanted to jump in talking about trips and stuff. Um, which actually Maria is flying out, but you flew in from Basel. How long were you there for for your trip that you were there for? Uh, I went to Basel for two weeks, nice. um, but I was in Basel for a week, and then I ended up going to Venice for the Biennale. Oh my god! Was super awesome. Cool. Was it your first time in uh, in Switzerland? My first time in Switzerland, and it's just the most beautiful place. It's gorgeous. I loved it. It was amazing. And it were you at a gorgeous, booth yeah. or were you part of a group show? So I was invited by um, some curators from Basel, Switzerland, who do a pop-up exhibition called Ping Pong. Oh, that's mm-hmm. And they've been doing this in Basel, Switzerland for uh, many years, at least a decade, I think. And it takes place in a refurbished warehouse that's nice. sort of like an old foundry. You could actually see these tracks running through the floor from where there was a tracking system and there's that's a cool. crane outside and a crucible holder um, and skylights in the windows. It's really industrial and cool. Mm-hmm. And that's about a couple of blocks away from the main convention center. So it's sort of a satellite fair, but everyone in Basel knows this exhibition and they visit it and oh, buy wow. from it. So, so it's kind of like a stop before you go to the actual It's like the event. underground sort of art show. And then um, in tandem with that, um, the curator's husband is in a rock band punk rock band so like tradition every year when they have the exhibition opening they do a punk rock show in the basement so (laughs) how cool is that you have all of these sort of upper echelon collectors that show up and then the artists follow and then all the punks come in at the end for this really (laughs) loud intense show in the basement which people just cram and i couldn't even get down there i was just like listening from the outside yeah you have to have earplugs down there it's just it's quite a quite a scene but it was incredible, amazing. incredible. <laughs> Switzerland is is such a strange place in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's like people there earn probably the most money from any country in Europe, and Europe is already rich. So right. Switzerland is kind of like the probably the richest country. A lot of, of the, the rich countries. A lot of the youth that I met there were the most educated, uh, bored people that I've ever met. And yeah. In a way, they they had blown through all these different majors and degrees, and they were just like, oh well, you know, I'll study art history, or maybe I'll study literature, or maybe I'll study, you know. And they were they're running through majors, and just they're very educated. Yeah, yeah. But also sort of unimpressed in a way. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure, but in Austria, the the whole um, uh, college education is free, right? So it also has a different value to the people, right? right? So in a way, you can get one major after the other, and it's mm-hmm. it's free, you know. So it's like, right. I, I mean, I learned that when I when I started, uh, you know, my my masters here in the United States that. It means something completely different for an for an American, mm-hmm. a U.S. American person to go to college, than it means to a to a European person. Most of Europe, I believe, uh, it's that really, uh, the, you know, that if if you put yourself in debt for a very long time, or you decide 
not to do that. You know, in in Austria, you don't have to think about that. You know? Right. It's, it's not even an issue. It's not an issue. It's, it's like a right. It's, it's like a given still, right. Still, that um, people from lower social, you know, class Income or incomes, yeah. they have a harder time just financing their apartment or you know their life without right. working. But it's not about the money for the school, you know. So, mm -hmm. well, we did our research before our interview, and being here that we're, we are in Miami and we're repping South Florida artists and creatives, we saw that you went to a certain university of Miami locally here as well to pursue That's your. That's correct. Degrees. Could you expand upon that a little bit, your experience sure. there? Sure. Uh, that's actually how I ended up in Miami. I moved here, I think, in 2014, 13, 14, uh, to pursue my Master of Fine Arts at UM. Um, I was sort of at a crossroads in my life, and I needed to make a change. And so I was trying to figure out, I'd always wanted to do my Master of Fine Arts. I had uh, done my BFA, which I graduated in 2009, and I sort of worked in... Um, Northern Palm Beach area teaching and having a studio and being a crazy artist mm -hmm. kind of floating a little bit without direction just kind of being and it was wonderful but it was at that point where I was like all right I need to do this uh, I was 29 years old at the time uh, so before before I turn 30 I'm gonna try to go do this so I applied to UM and I got the full ride and yes. I moved to Miami. Talking about money. Right, of Amazing. course. Amazing, wow. Otherwise, it would be extremely expensive. Yeah. It's really the only way to do an art degree. And yeah. I tell a lot of my students that as well. You want to try to go for the scholarships. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up here, and I lived in um, Coral Springs, Boca Raton, Delray Beach most of my life. I traveled quite a bit, but during the summer times for brief intervals, and I had never really moved away. So this was my first time sort of packing up my life and relocating it permanently. But so you were born in Florida? Yes, I'm a third generation Floridian. My grandmother wow. was actually born um, during a hurricane in a basement <gasps> in West Palm Beach. Talking oh, about hurricanes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's in my blood. I'm not half wow. of the family anyway. Yeah. So my mom, my mom's half. They're all Southerners. Mm, so, super neat. Yeah, I'm a Florida girl. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I always used to want to escape Florida, but every time I leave, I always sort of miss it. It's mm -hmm. no place quite like it. It's like another planet here. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, I feel like it is. <laughs> like the sun and the, the I don't ocean know, the people and, and yeah. the attitude. It's sort of like a mixture of north and south, and it's divided state, and it's, you know, yeah. it's a lot of different things. But Miami, I had no idea how different it was. Miami down here. was from the rest of Florida, right? Right, right. It's much Completely. more international. You did move into a different country. <laughs> it literally was like I moved uh, like thousands of miles away from yeah. my home. It's what it felt like. Yeah. And I did not think it would feel like that at all. Yeah, yeah. So my UM experience was great. Um, it was more like a residency for me. It's um, a little bit more private. It, the new art building is separated from the school. So we it's have, yeah. yeah, so it's sort of like a separate little building and it's kind of quiet there. And the new building didn't, my studio didn't have windows. It was oh. like a <laughs> sensory deprivation chamber. Wow. Um, like my old studio upstairs and it's kind of feels a little bit like a coffin when you don't have a right, window. Right. And you sort of like disappear into this void when you're working and you like come out, you stumble out into the light, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. what time is it? But um, it was a marathon, the MFA. It was a marathon. Was it two years or three years program? Three yeah. years. Three mm -hmm. years. And then uh, the last two years you teach. Mm -hmm. So you're able to get teaching experience and, um, you know, it's a great, I wish I would have taken advantage of the UM resources a little bit more because the college itself is massive and amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, I was sort of, you know, immersed in my work and cool. overanalyzing it as a, as a grad student might do. Yeah. <laughs> So that was that was that, and I finished uh, last year. Mm -hmm. Oh, congratulations! So. And you had a beautiful show at the UM Gallery in Greenwood. Yes, that and was last this May. Is, yeah, in the it. in the black and white striped building, the Greenwood Building. Yes. The Greenwood Building. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that was a great show. Right? Thank you. That was a beautiful, beautiful show. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad I was here for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys coming. Mm -hmm. It was. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how would you describe it. Uh, um, if I try to describe it, if you, I always imagine it like a like a sparkly sort of tinsel world. I don't know, maybe that's in my mind. <laughs> my work doesn't look anything like that, but well, fragile is it's like, like what yeah. I, fragile. I think of fragility when I see your pieces. A room full yeah. of porcelain shapes floating and, and hanging and precariously balanced on glass pedestals. But very mathematical also. It's a, I mean, it's not a football because a football has more of those, you know, 
um, how do you call them? Eight shapes uh, Size. octagon? Uh, that's a, so the, the shape that I focused my thesis exhibition on is a icosahedron, which is a 20-sided. Jesus. Which is not a football, shape. a soccer ball? It's the closest shape to a circle, modular. Mm-hmm. And which is why I settled on it, because it has the most connection points. But a soccer ball, do you know how many? Right. I think it uh, has more than a soccer ball. It has more than a soccer it's ball. It's like a, if you've ever played Dungeons & Dragons, which I've had some Dungeons & Dragons <laughs> nerds walk past my studio when I was a grad student. Some of these uh, gentlemen that had worked for the school were like, oh my god, like Dungeons & Dragons, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> not what I was going for, but... I'm really glad you enjoy it. How did you come up with, what's it called again? The icosahedron. Icosahedron. C-O-S-A-D. Icosahedron. That's Greek, right? Icosahedron, it's a Greek shape, yes. So it's part of the five, uh, they call it the Plutonic solids, Mm -hmm. or Plato, I guess, Plutonic solids. And um, they represent an element of, of, of the earth. So earth, air, fire, water, spirit, and each shape has been assigned. But these are shapes that are naturally occurring in nature and under a microscope and formations and has to do with the whole realm of, um, it does have a lot to do with math and science, but that's not Mm -hmm. why I ended up settling on it, maybe in an abstract way. Mm -hmm. Are you interested more like in the sacred geometry of the shape? I think I was researching a lot of the sacred geometry to try to explain why I was so drawn Uh to this shape, but it wasn't the direct reason why I started uh, doing that particular shape. Um, and I can elaborate on that. <laughs> yes. what, what was the secret? <laughs> Our listeners, secret? come, we're going to get it out of her. What is the secret out, reason for that it. you came to the hydrosoplorum? The, the icosahedron. I'm going to make you say it three times. I had the hedron section in my part, but not the icosis. I could even hedron. be pronouncing it wrong. I'm not even sure. But. We're going to ask Andrea Spiridonakos. Yeah, somebody <laughs> somebody who's somebody She's who's Greek. A, have. <laughs> she might have a better mm-hmm. idea. But... Um, So the reason I started making these sort of uh, modular shapes in porcelain is when I first got to grad school, I totally freaked out. I was going through this massive life change and I just didn't know what to do in the grad school and I was wildly depressed and anxious. Like any grad school program. Maybe, I I don't know. A lot of people in grad school talk, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I had a lot of life changes happening at the Mm -hmm. time and for whatever reason, I I, I usually suffer very loudly. (laughs) I don't Mm -hmm. hold it in very well, so I'm very vocal about how I feel. So um, it's just a total mess. And the first semester, I, I didn't even know what to do on top of being totally disoriented. I just didn't know what to make. Now I've, I've been making art on my own for four years. What do I do now under the scrutiny of the committee and all this pressure? So um, my solution was uh, a relaxation method that I like to, which is folding origami. And I like to fold origami because it's simple motions. It's almost like a meditation, a moving meditation. Mm-hmm. So fold, 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 and I kind of get lost in it. And then I'll fold in increments of a thousand. So I don't know if you know of the thousand crane legend, Mm -hmm. the Japanese legend. It's uh, for weddings or funerals, good luck. Um, And there was there is this children book that is really beautiful about Hiroshima. Yes, have you read that? that Yeah, yeah. So I know Mm -hmm. about that one. Uh, Beautiful story, Mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had done a thousand cranes before as an exercise, and so I decided to do a thousand boats as my next feet. And I was going to, I was invited to participate at a show in the projects in Fort Lauderdale with uh, Leah Brown space uh, called Project Space. Mm-hmm. And I had envisioned this bed with all these floating origami boats. And the boat, the boat to me represented a vessel of like the mm-hmm. thought. And mm-hmm. it would be, you know, had a lot of sim- symbolism to me, carrying away this thought. Or So I, what, I, what I was doing is writing down how I was feeling as a cathartic method of dealing with my emotions and then folding it into a boat and making a pile. Mm -hmm. So over the course of three months, I folded a thousand boats. Well, lots of thoughts. Some were thoughts, some I had photocopied. I was experimenting with some drawings, different color papers. Um, And of course my committee is like, what are you doing? You're here for ceramics, but they didn't really say anything. They gave me the the first semester grace period to experiment. Um, And I ended up doing an installation of the thousand boats. And at the last second, I changed it to having the boats coming out of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And the project space is an amazing warehouse with uh, three stories tall. So these boats were- In Fan Village, right? Yeah, with a single light coming down. And it was just super dramatic. And I think that sort of sparked my interest in the shadows and the dimensions and hanging things. And so mm-hmm. that was my first semester project, was mm-hmm. this sort of fantastical, surreal landscape of boats mm-hmm. flying out of a suitcase. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I think it just goes to show how not doing something within the media that you're accustomed to or drawn to can help eventually release new ideas or just, I don't know, just like unleash and be liberating further and unleash creativity. New yeah. themes also, right? That are, yeah. that are just emerging through like this immediate just making like, right. without thinking too much about right. it. Right, mm-hmm. the meditation. And then mm-hmm. sort of the accumulation of these boats that took me three months. So I would look at this pile of boats and I'm like, that's three months of my life. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like a modular incremental way to calculate time. So that mm-hmm. was a really interesting concept to me. So of course mm-hmm. I was doing all this research and grabbing at straws and trying to figure out what I was doing. And then the muse kind of went away. Mm-hmm. She was like, oh, you're trying too hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, I had a sketchbook full of weird research and, you know, the committee is always like, what are you doing? They, cr- they scrutinize you in grad school. So um, I figured I had to start doing something in ceramics. So I began experimenting with the casting process, which is why I wanted to go to that school in the first place as mm-hmm. the chair of that department specializes in slip casting. Cool. Mm-hmm. And I was interested in multiples. So I started trying to cast these geometric forms from paper. Mm-hmm. And one thing led to another. I was all over the place. I went from here to there mm-hmm. and ended up at the end with this single modular shape as a circle. And I'm very fascinated by systems and structures and the way things fit together. So I was building these forms that sort of mimic systems in nature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, I was thinking about that too because the way you connected those soccer balls. <laughs> <laughs> you can call them whatever you want. It's fine. No I judgment. Saw, oh, I'm I so saw sorry. Drawn. Everybody's going to judge you except there are millions of listeners. I saw he drawn. I co so I co You can drawn. call it the, the geometric forms. The, the geometric forms. Okay. The, the, <laughs> the, the way you connected them is really like it, it, one thing, one word that comes to my mind is organic. Mm-hmm. Like the way that stalagmites, stal- another difficult word. Say it wow. in German. Well, stalagmites, 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 and stalagmites. Yes, they they grow in in uh, in caves, right? right. Where, the, where the salt is it salt or like the calcium water calcium deposit? Yeah, and that was another inspiration and, for the forms yeah. because those are also time. Mm-hmm. So they're structures that form over time. So it was mm-hmm. this idea of a, of a nature time versus my time, mm-hmm. and, and what is time really? You know, mm-hmm. how is time recorded? How do we increment time? So that mm-hmm. was a. A reference, oh, but then so also that the connection between like synapses in the head, like synapses, right. like in, in like you know it is and relationships, organic and maps. kind of relationships, yeah, right. relationships yeah. between maps. things and people and yeah. I was thinking like memories. the DNA strand with some of the way that some mm-hmm. of them twist or like the way you see like molecules in the body. I don't know, like the 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 intertwinedness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then is also the fragility, of course, because it's porcelain. You yeah. know, it could break at any moment. It looks. Like always, kind of hazardously, kind of ha- hanging ha- there. Hazardously, ha- hazardously. <laughs> There's some words I can't really pronounce. I think that's one of them. But you know what I mean. Precarious. Ha- we'll precarious. Yes. Precarious. Yeah. That. And then. Yeah, there's there's some the color that has also something special. I love like that it's muted. I love that it's like a nude, muted color. Well, they had too much by the shadows. It's almost like. Um, Makes me think Bone, of the giver, maybe. like absolutely. No, it's it's yeah. kind of like not pristine, but uh, when something is untainted, you know, it's pure, pure, hmm. yeah, something pure. That's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. think I was I was trying to keep it as close to paper as possible because mm-hmm. that was another oh, that was, connection. Yeah. Yeah. Like paper to porcelain, fragile. You know, if you drop a piece of paper, it won't break, but if you drop a mm-hmm. piece of porcelain, it will. Mm-hmm. You can tear a piece of paper. Porcelain lasts forever mm-hmm. as long as it doesn't drop on the floor, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it lasts in shards. So I was playing with a lot of these concepts, concepts as I was making, but I think as in that particular body of work and the way I work, it's sort of like intuitive mm-hmm. as opposed to direct. Um, I, a con- conceptual artist, I would say, have a message and they shoot for it. But for me, it's sort of like a curiosity and exploration of the process. Mm-hmm. And then I stand back and look and I go, oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. That reminds mm-hmm. me of this. And it sort of leads into the, it's like an investigation. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with ceramics. It's like research. Like you're continuing your research from the paper to, right. to the, to the ceramic, right. to the, to the form. And then, and then into the installation and then also into video, right? right. You also had a video in then that. some projections mm-hmm. and analog versus digital because they do look 3D printed, but they're mm-hmm. completely analog, done 100% mm-hmm. by hand, meticulously mm-hmm. that take forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the process is a long one. Um, so all these things are really interesting to me, mm-hmm. I think. 
I'm curious how you went from, I'll be more specific, the geometric form mm -hmm. to the exploration of the geometric form with like the face, like the natural form. I feel like the contrast of those two is stark, but it's just also like quite beautiful. The figurative, you mean? Yes, like you had the actual, like um, I think it's like a, a it's a bust. bust is yeah. it like a, yeah. I took a figure sculpting class and, and that was my sort of trying to put my fingerprint on that, on that image, but and I did play a little bit with casting my own face and, and putting them with the shapes, but it, it just seemed a little bit too obvious to me or something. That's mm -hmm. the one we're using for our preview if our listeners see our preview. It's a beautiful image, too. So uh, a friend of mine, Kristen Page Minot, who's she a was talented. She number three, yeah, super talented. RCS is number three. A shout out to my girl, uh -huh. Third uh, brilliant and talented photographer who mm -hmm. took that image. Totally. Um, so we have to give her photo cred for that one. Yes. Um, but yeah, the the... The faces, especially because my work before that, my undergraduate work was very uh, whimsical and had a lot of creatures and faces, and I think I wanted to really divide myself from that former life. Oh, wow. Oh, so that was, so when was I got to grad complete. school, it was a complete rejection of my former work. If you see my former work, it's colorful mm -hmm. and multicolored and creepy and faces mm -hmm. and creatures and whimsical. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to, like when I got here, I completely severed that. I wanted to be somebody else. Was mm -hmm. it mostly sculptural or was it also like paint and photo? And I did a lot of uh, drawing and painting as well, mm -hmm. watercolors and drawings on the sculptures and carving into the sculptures, a lot of that. It's a, almost like a, you can see the repetition in the, in the designs mm -hmm. that I would carve little circles. So the repetition is still there. It's just expressed in a totally different way. I completely mm -hmm. changed my work when I went to graduate school. I think mm -hmm. that was my goal. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take a more, I guess, sophisticated approach. Mm -hmm. Change you were a little mm -hmm. bit, but not far too off from like the process and way you were accustomed to, I guess, working through um, investigation, as you said. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. When did you first start, like, to dabble in like the arts, and like, how old were you? Uh, I think I was four. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I've been teaching for a long time as well, and I've taught children through museums and schools, and now I teach college and high school. But I, I, my theory is everyone is an artist up until about the third grade, because that's when you learn shame. Because that's when the kids start saying, oh, I can't do it. He's mm -hmm. better than me. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. They're afraid, afraid mm -hmm. of failure. You know, Up until about the third grade, you have fearlessness, and you want to try and explore everything, mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. I had a seven-year-old today uh, at, at the Overtown Library where I'm teaching for project art, and uh, he was a seven-year-old, and he was, like, saying, afraid of, like, cutting into the paper, and I was, like, saying, no, you can do it, and I was, like, no, I can't do it, I can't do it, and then he was doing it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I thought about exactly that, you know, this, when do kids learn that they don't, that they can't do it, you know, that it's, mm -hmm. like, probably not going to be right or about the third grade third grade experience yeah. of maybe even second grade yeah yeah but um also too if you're teaching kids from lower socioeconomic platforms yeah. they're they're not used to getting nice things so they're afraid to oh, ruin them. Yeah. or it goes the opposite way and they just treat it like like it's nothing because yeah. they're not used to getting nice things so i understand you'll see they, it's really interesting especially mm -hmm. as a psychologist you'll you'll see a lot mm -hmm. of really interesting things when kids mm -hmm. try to make art Really I mean, the, the first kid that started to, to make make the make something, you know, he made like this, I told you uh, about this, the, the um, alien tie, an alien tie, right. and really put it on him, you know, oh, they're it looked hilarious. like amazing. I was like, how the hell did you just come up? I gave you like a manila cheap paper with some pencils, and he made an alien like an alien tie. And he had a label been. for it and everything, right? And then yeah. he, he gave it to me at the end, and I was like, are you sure? And it was like so <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But that's have, like, incredible, right? It's like, I think wow, it's just like blown away. Some people are just born with it too. Like, and even those yeah. that don't, aren't, like I try to tell my students, like you're problem solvers. Like that's basically what artists are. Like you find, you have materials and you do something with it. Like, you're solving, there's nothing, that's your problem. You make something, you create, there's no errors. Like it's yeah. just about finding a solution. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so you started at four. Did you dabble like with paint, clay, or just a little bit of everything? I was definitely drawing. Um, I My mother was an artist, <gasps> interestingly oh. enough, but never pursued it. What media? She was a, be a beautiful uh, drawing and painting um, artist. And I found her portfolio of figure drawing. She was super uh, talented when it came to charcoal and paint. 
but she started in college and kind of tapered off and tried to do like an actual job, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think she, she always told me that she was afraid to try to do it full force yeah. and have the, the dedication. Mm -hmm. So she loves that I'm an artist. She lives a little bit <laughs> vicariously through me, just like, yay. Um, but she, I found that portfolio and I wanted to be an artist. Uh, my other talent was music and, oh, and yeah. performing. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I was a little, what a little diva. Theater? And oh yeah, singing and dancing and acting. Wow, that was my thing. And I did that till I was about thirteen. Amazing. Yep. And then uh, I think I, at that point, I, I learned shame for some reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I know the reason. It was uh, my family was breaking up. For, mm -hmm. uh, my parents were going through a pretty awful mm -hmm. divorce. Sorry. So it was super traumatic for the whole family. And I just didn't want to be on stage anymore and be in front of people. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh well, I'll do my other talent, which is drawing. Mm -hmm. So, but you know. The, the musicalness or the mu musicality, I guess. I can't even speak either, but. No, it is. That's a word. It sort of well, translates. That's kind of like our common thread. That's like difficult musicality. words. Or like We're just going to make words up. It's okay. The master's agree. It's fine. We're all right. academics here. We'll just sound like, just sound confident. Uh, I feel like the, the work itself, even the work now, is they sort of have a musical quality mm -hmm. to them in a way. They do. Like they're like notes. Yeah. There's like om almost a tone to them, right? Right. And you can always, almost hear them. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have like a cadence and a rhythm because mm -hmm. rhythm is important in my work too, rhythm yeah. and repetition. So mm -hmm. it all translates in the work at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't really suppress it too much mm -hmm. as much as you'd like to. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, but mostly drawing and painting. And I, I was always adding three-dimensional things to my artworks when I was a kid, you know. We were supposed to make paper masks in fourth grade for Halloween, and I had cut all these things and made pop-out things and pop-out eyes, and it won, like, first prize. <laughs> um, awesome. My mom actually reminded me of when I was in fifth grade. I would dump plaster into a bucket, and I had totally forgotten about this. I dumped plaster into a bucket, cast it, dumped it out, and chiseled it into a dragon form <laughs> for, like, a week and a half. Look at you. I completely forgot. Um, and then interestingly enough, uh, my mother and I had a conversation last week where she gave me some old ceramics and we talked about it and I, she remembered that my grandmother used to do ceramics and she would cast these figurines and then glaze them and then fire them in a kiln she had. And I totally didn't realize that my grandmother was a slip casting ceramic artist. I mean, she would buy the molds. Wow. She would buy the molds. This was sort of a hobby thing that they yeah. did in the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. but. Um, but interesting, right? Very specific. How that how that goes on from one generation to the other. Very, also, right? very strange. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. especially she was a. It's very. She was slip casting ceramics. Which yeah, is that's exactly really what I do. And that's yeah. the the grandmother was that was born during a hurricane. Yes, that was a very long. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Miss uh, Gwen, uh -huh. born during Hurricane Diane, which is my mother's name. Wow, <laughs> I can't remember the year exactly, but we'll but, look it up. Yeah, I'm Hurricane, interested. Hurricane Diane. That was a bad one too, right? I think so. She was in a basement, born mm. in a basement. Can you imagine? In Florida, West Palm Beach. I think there was like oh. a like a lower. That's yeah. what my mom told me. That now yeah. it sounds like a legend. Basement yeah, I was like in Florida. It basement in Florida. Florida. Like, uh, yeah, like, it was amazing. Maybe, maybe it's my memory that, that I've written. Basements. But I read she about was born all. Home. I know that for sure. All the hurricanes that had like low pressure. Uh, the the wind speeds that Irma has. And there were like 10, 15 names, you know, that came up. And oh, I, I was wondering if Diane was one of them, but I don't know. I'm not remember. sure. I'll have to look it up. But I remember seeing an article. Wow. Diane. So as a Florida native, right? And yes, uh, how, how do you, how do you, like, totally not art related, but how do you prepare for this hurricane? <laughs> and how do you, how do you deal well, with it? Oh, you know, with that, and we were talking about anxiety, you know, how do you deal with it? Are you, are you gonna make more, more paper boats or uh, is, is this a way to it's deal so, with it's it? It's sort or? of interesting. It's sort of like a frenzy that happens. Everyone's glued to the news and it's almost an excitement. Yeah, no, at the same but it's time. also an annoyance. It's like the election. Right, what it reminds me of it's like this mutual and it's all anyone collective. can talk about, and it's yeah. just consuming us all. Um, I think nine times out of ten, it's a miss. Yes. Nine times out of ten, you prepare and you stock up and you're hunkered down, ready for the worst, and it's a miss. But that one time yeah. that it gets you, it's bad, and you can get seriously injured if you're not prepared. Yeah. So you just have to take all the precautions, all the precautions. and it's annoying. Mm -hmm. Totally. But uh, for the most part, you buy a couple of bottles of wine and just... Uh, Better safe than sorry. Yeah, just try yeah. to stay calm. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was, I think the worst, I was in, not in Andrew, I was in Coral Springs at the time, I was uh, young. 
but I remember seeing the devastation down here, which was crazy. Horrific. Where we were, it wasn't as bad I, I, that I can remember. I was very young, but Wilma was 10 years ago, and we were shut down for two weeks with no power, oh, no yeah. AC. You know, I mean, stick of barbecue, no hot water. Yeah, sometimes the ones you least suspect are the wow. ones that make the most damage. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Wilma was nowhere as bad as Irma. Yeah, but it was a four, mm-hmm. I think. It was a four? Mm-hmm. Oh, it sometimes was just four. the wind Three and the rain four. that'll mess you yeah. up. The eye went right over Coral Springs, so mm-hmm. it, we got the worst of it. It was mm-hmm. bad. And it was just uh, debris on the road and flooding and mm-hmm. the whole night. But the power outages really were the... Mm-hmm. It's the aftermath. Oh, okay. yeah. And of course, it's beautiful weather because it sucks all the moisture up. So you're looking at the most gorgeous day in Florida, and it's just... <laughs> There's stuff all over the place. You can't get anywhere. That's so funny. Wow. Are you going to stay in Miami for the hurricane, or are you going to evacuate? I'm going to go up to... My mom lives in Boca, so mm-hmm. I'm going to go up and keep her company. Nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh. Cool. You're going to stay, Elisa, right? I'm staying in Sweetwater, so I'll let you know from the roof of my house if it floods. Whoa. <laughs> and Sweetwater is a flooding area? There always floods and the gators get out of the canal. So. Oh, wow. Fun times. Oh, my God. Fun it's the true, Florida. Gonna That's a true, Florida, true Florida. You're going to experience the experience true Florida. Right yeah, with the snakes and the gators and the frogs. But I'm curious, um, not in terms of what you're doing for Hurricane Prep, but like Hurricane Prep Studio. Because I think as an artist, you do have your studio space here at the Big House. Studio number what, by the way? Shout it out. I'm 22. Studio number 22 downstairs. at the Big mm-hmm. House downstairs for floor what are you doing to prepare for the storm in your studio um for me i'm in the center i've never been in this structure it doesn't leak in my studio so unless the roof comes off you know i'm just gonna say a little prayer yes and then uh, i'm also in charge of the ceramics area around here so i went into the kiln room and tarped all the kilns and moved them into the center um and bungeed things down and put loose items inside the ceramics room just mm-hmm. in case. Just mm-hmm. in case. But for the most part, if it's a if it's a five and the roof comes off, it's pretty much a done deal. Yeah. There's nothing a lot that you can do. Well, that's if that's not the case. But for the most part, if you were a ceramic artist, you would want to elevate all the kilns, get get things high off the floor, mm-hmm. unplug everything, take your electronics. Mm-hmm. You could put plastic over things that are valuable, put things in Tupperware that are valuable in case of water damage, but. That's yeah, we were just talking about our rocking chair sessions, Polaroids that are going to go into it, Tupperware. That's if it leaks, you know, that's if it leaks or you have water damage. If the roof comes off and it's flattened, I mean, everything's destroyed. And that's it. But and that's, that's the very slim chance. That's going to be, it's going to be it, right? If the roof comes off, it's going to be it. That's pretty much a That's like Wizard of Oz situation. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty I'm, much a done deal. I'm curious, going forward, because you, you finished, you just finished your master's. How does it feel transitioning from just having completed your degree to coming to the bake house then going to art basel how do you feel like where we're, we're and teaching already and teaching already like where are you where are you now in terms of like your next potential body of work um that's a good question i think um people feel a little bit lost when they get out of grad school but mm-hmm. while i was in grad school i was very active in the miami art scene i went to cool. a lot of shows um i got picked up by locust who represented me at nada uh for a basel or two two basels um and just trying to help out friends and their projects and trying to make uh, friends in a community outside of school because i've been i've been out, i had been out of school for four or five years and i know how important that is and people get very I remember from my undergrad when I was dumped out into the wild, how alone you feel without yeah. your community. So I spent a lot of time um, outside of the school, which the school did not appreciate. I think I was not the best student. <laughs> I was not seen as like the best academic student, but uh, I would consider myself successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think um, one of the more successful ones, I'd like to mm-hmm. say. On record, <laughs> I, but did just, you hear that, guys? <laughs> <laughs> just a tooting my own horn. No, I, I think so, and I think it's important that you focus on your your landing point. So, um, I was invited to teach at New World School of the Arts. I don't know how. I guess I was recommended through people that they were looking for a ceramics teacher. That's exciting. Um, because people in the community know I do ceramics and contemporary mm-hmm. ceramics, specifically casting. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm teaching, I, I'm adjunct teaching at a couple of different places, and I do private lessons for children. And uh, the first year I was out of school, I sold a bunch of work at Basel. It was amazing. I was published in a book cool. of uh, contemporary ceramics, and I was like, I'm going to be fine. Wow, that's and like awesome. It was so good. I graduated, and I went to Europe on like a, like a magical adventure for like two weeks just because, you know, it was like, it was like, this is my graduation present. 
And then the following Basel was a really tough year, and I, I did not sell very much, and it, this year has been really tough. So the up and down is something that, that's taking a little bit of acclimating to. But for yeah. the most part, I've been working all over the place. I work here at the Bakehouse trying to get a ceramics program going, um, classes and things like that mm -hmm. uh, to help out. Um, and it's been really hard to carve out time to make my work. Extremely difficult. We talk about that a lot with the different guest artists we've had, finding the balance between your personal practice and then the day job that sustains your personal practice right. and how for a lot of people, obviously it's not easy, but it's just you have to keep on going and pursuing what you love. So I'm glad that you're still well teaching within what you do, which is like casting and ceramics, but also hopefully eventually that'll you'll carve out time and you'll be able to right that's the goal and you know i thought about the commercial route maybe i'll make uh, more vessel type of things and do design work and and i've the thing is with me is i'm jumping around i have a lot of irons in the fire and i'm just waiting for one to Strike. yield some fruit mm -hmm. um so that i can maybe go in that particular direction but that's sort of been my my uh process yeah is do multiple things and eventually the others will fall away and something will will come it's, it's not a direct plan, but it's a direction. Yeah. So I'm moving in a direction and just hoping to, you know, be presented with my next opportunity. Being so. productive, you're not staying still. And I think that's what's important. And that's what a lot of people have suggested is just, like, don't be stagnant. Don't just not do anything. You have to continue working and eventually something will, like you say, yield. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just try to do things that are interesting to you and, and also have a really strong community. Be friends with artists and talk about art and read about art and... Um, right now, I'm, I'm learning a lot about administrative sort of things, especially working with the bakehouse and crunching numbers. And um, I've been really good at Excel. I put my entire life in iCal. I do, <laughs> I do my expenses at the end of the month, and I enter them into an Excel spreadsheet for the first wow. time. Wow! Yeah, so it, it makes me feel a little more in control of my totally mm -hmm. out of control life. But um, just trying to be the most effective with the minimal amount of time because I'm constantly doing a million things. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So. Carving out time for myself has been difficult. Um, I'm trying to depart from that body of work that I produced in grad school. Okay. Um, at the time when I had to land on that shape, so to speak, I was, I had gone from paper boats to all the way around. I did these drip experiments with like trying to do Arduino technology and make vocal stalactites and done these weird forms that kind of looked like poops and mm -hmm. I, I went all the way to the other side and the last review before my thesis review they were like okay rope it in make a show so I sort of had to stop and in my studio I have a little shelf with glass and I have a few of these little experiments I've kept the ones that have been really interesting one of each because mm -hmm. I had to throw out a lot of them and oh, no. One of each of the ideas that I had to stop on before I had to produce. And so they're there. You know, I shed things of, as the years go by, as we mm -hmm. all do, and, and you keep certain things. Mm -hmm. and you're holding on to them for a reason. They're mm -hmm. clues, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, they're there, you know. So I'd like to, I think, use maybe those processes in the future. But right now I'm really focusing on a new body of work, so I'm doing a lot of research and reading, mm -hmm. particularly about uh, climate change and how mm -hmm. it because obviously it's a hot topic right now mm -hmm. with this impending flooding. Hot, like literally mm -hmm. hot. Hot, like it's always hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. It's rising, really. Um, I'm particularly. <laughs> We're so funny today. No, it's just always I love the, the play with oh, words today. Yeah, it's no, just it's like, probably yeah. me. Um, but I'm really interested in landscape changes that take place in glaciers, okay. and there's a particular phenomena occur that occurs that, that are called polygonal ice wedges. So it's basically when the permafrost begins to thaw, they mm -hmm. form like this sort of core that melts and then refreezes, and they form these polygons on the surface, mm -hmm. wow. which is similar to my shape, and they're mm -hmm. beautiful. They look like aliens did them. Cool. Some of them are raised, some of them are, are bumps. And what's happening is usually the water um, drain, it, it melts and then freezes, melts and then freezes, but now it's melting and not refreezing, so it's draining. And mm -hmm. where is it coming? To Miami shores. Mm -hmm. So now there's this shift in the balance of the water, which actually the icosahedron is the um, geometric solid for water. Oh. Which I didn't realize when I started to do. It's the, it's it's the element, it represents the ele element of water, yes. So it all oh, kind of, yeah. sort. and I didn't know, that was a discovery I made when I was looking up the sacred geometry, like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, well, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, so anyway, I'm really interested in how these new systems are forming, since I am so interested in systems and relationships. And mm -hmm. these are questions that I'm asking as I'm focusing on these new forms that I'm making, which are uh, sort of diamond forms and gemstone forms. Mm -hmm. So I've been looking at images of these ice wedges and what they look like and making these forms and playing with formations. But that's sort of the, the underpinnings of why I'm doing these forms. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense, that it's sort of influencing the work. It's not a direct... Um, comment on what's happening, but it is underneath it, and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens as I start to form the process. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important to just start the process because then people will ask how the process was informed, what inspired you, and then that's how you can then delve into the research you've been doing, the importance of what it is that you want to talk about, which is global warming, and how these you know, shapes take place and what's occurring and how it's affecting. Basically, our, our, everybody's denying we're not supposed to say global warming. Our changing global in the temperature. Global climate change. Warming. Our climate change. <laughs> global um, warming. Um, and how the, that's, where's the you know, accordion? All of our, all of our global flooding. Global warming. All the flooding that occurs all the time. Like, um, you see it in Miami Beach, like, oh, it's raining. Take out your Uggs and your rain boots and, you know, just, right. your well, duck boats. And, I, for, I think a lot of people are trying to be warning about it, but for me, I find it so fascinating that we are at a tipping point. I think there's been five mass extinctions on the planet where the Earth is heated and cooled, heated mm -hmm. and cooled, and we are at that tipping point. Most people don't get to see that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are at that point where we're actually starting to see changes in the environment, which is super, I find it fascinating, and I find these formations kind of beautiful. And I imagine what a world would look like without human beings. And maybe it's these gigantic polygonal ice wedge diamonds in this sci-fi like landscape and, and I Nobody think it's, to wear them. Yeah. we won't be there. I mean we might be in domes or in outer space, you know, on a satellite, but um, it'll a be uninhabitable. Worlds. Yeah. I like well, like a Kevin Cosner water wall situation. <laughs> Where we'll all evolve <laughs> gills. Where we wear well, what? I don't I don't know what you're Water seen World water it's a cult classic. We oh Water World? It. Is that yes. with Kevin Costner? Yeah, yes. yes. one of the biggest luck. Oh we yeah, have homework to do. that was a right. Big, big oh, please flaw. do watch that film. I oh I love God. that film. It was a big disaster. It was the most expensive uh, flop. Super expensive. Wow. And, and it flopped um, for some reason. It hit. Yeah. It hit. A, it hit a lot of reasons. It hit a spot. It hit a lot of reasons why it flopped. But I love it. I love cheesy sort of sci-fi. I have to rewatch it. And it's it was ahead of its time because it, I think it took probably place in that Texas. was the problem, right? I think it was Texas, and yeah. the city was underwater, and these people were living on these sort of floating garbage lands. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. it happened. But yeah, I find it really interesting that we're at this tipping point, and, mm -hmm. and now new systems are forming, and what might that look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I can talk a little bit more to the glaciers because I, I um, grew up and lived in Austria most of my life. And it's really like the changes that we saw there that we, you know, you, you can go skiing in the summer in Austria. You all, We were always able to go, but since glaciers are melting so much now, it's, it's you know, you're not really able to do that as much anymore. And glaciers are also getting more and more dangerous for mountain climbers and, you know, glacier right. hikers because of, we call it in German Gletscherspalte. So the gl Gletscherspalte. Gletscher so it's like the, they, cleave, they cleave pieces off, right? No, it's like a, a cliff in the glacier ah. where you don't see on the surface that you actually can fall 10, 20 feet, no, meters or more feet mm -hmm. down and you die there right. because there's no way you get out of it. Right, right. So these Gletscherspaltens, and they, they are actually, there are a lot of stories about that. And my grandfather actually had a skiing and mountain climbing school. So he was a teacher, he would do that all the time, so you know, and it was kind of, it's kind of like in my family. So when you talk about glaciers and those shapes and those beautiful forms, it's really, um, sounds very familiar to me, and I can I can I, I can think see that it residency in, in the Arctic. You should look into that, Lauren. I've seen yeah. it. It's uh, the one Kristen did, right? I no, not did the one in Alaska. About her Alaska. No, this is the one that Voices of the Wilderness. She yes. was in the wilderness, but not she in the... She was in the Alaskan in the wilderness, but mm -hmm. she wasn't at the Arctic Circle. Like I'm, oh, it was Alaska, Alaska. she Antarctic was, right? Arctic. Alaska? Was it Alaska? I sound so ignorant right now. Um, <laughs> 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 I believe there's a residency not in Alaska at the the actual Antarctic yeah. Circle. Like, mm -hmm. I heard about that, to. too. I, yeah. I, where you live on a boat? I don't think you live on a boat. I think you live in an igloo or some sort wow. of location. 
Well, after my China experience, I think I'm... You did a residency in China. I don't know if you guys knew that. No, I knew it. Sure. Tell us about it. I had no idea. I so. think you told me about so it. So when but did you go to China? I went to China my second year in grad school. I was invited as a guest fellow to uh, come to a residency in a town called Jindajin, which is... Jindajin. I probably Jindajin. butchered it. It was the closest way I could say it. But it's in southern China and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And it is the capital of where all the porcelain and ceramics oh. are produced in the entire world. Perfect. Wow. Mm -hmm. and you're, that's so In great. China. So it's an industrial town. And we're talking like industrial ceramic objects down to teacups, teapots, mass producing factories, slip casting, throwing. That's amazing. There's a college, a university there where people go to study the art of ceramics. And um, there's two residencies there. One is called the Pottery Workshop, which goes through, I think, a residency program in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And then San Bao Ceramic Art Studio, which is a, a Buddhist monastery, basically, uh, rebuilt mm -hmm. in the mountains. And that's the one I was at, of course. So I'm my go to San Bao. And do, uh, do they take anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that one is invitational only. The other yeah. one is Palm Beach. Well, uh, I'm sorry, it goes through West Virginia State. A university as an exchange program. You go for two weeks, I think. That one is more like they take you to the Beijing, um, the Great Wall, and you do a whole tour, um, and it's in the town. So what's interesting about that place is that it has, it's a lot of post-production work. Mm -hmm. So you don't create any of your own things. There's somebody that makes the slip for you, and there's somebody that makes a mold for you, and there's somebody that glazes the work for you. It basically takes the, the people that, uh, that, wor that workers do one job, and they get very good at it, and you use these people almost like tools. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a delegation. Right. Yeah, you, you come up with the master of the blueprint, and you tell somebody who does every other job for you. Which is an interesting art, uh, discussion about uh, agency and, and, and idea, and mm -hmm. who is an artist, right? What, mm -hmm. what makes a piece of art if someone else makes it for you, which is, I think, a hot topic in contemporary mm -hmm. art specifically. And we could talk about Duchamp, right? And his urinal. Or we mm -hmm. have Frito, yeah, as well, here locally. Mm -hmm. He has a lot, he has factories or right. individuals that do work for him. Well, that's mm -hmm. more com on or the commercial Rubens. side, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these people are commercial potters. I mean, there's a lot of people. Most of them, I think Sambao is more of a, a wheel throwing studio, doing mm -hmm. a lot of pottery. Mm -hmm. uh, my story was sort of interesting. I ended up, I was going for a month and a half to live in this small town. I've never been to Asia or China at all. Uh, I got on a plane at 7 a.m. from Miami. I landed in Texas. There was really bad weather. <laughs> that was where my connecting flight was. We come back to Texas. My connecting flight, it was late to touch down due to inclement weather. I Aww. missed my flight. I had to get rerouted to Tokyo. I landed in Shanghai at midnight, no luggage. Now, I had to get from Shanghai to Jinajen on a separate flight. The airport is across town, it's an hour and a half. So my plan was, my genius plan, which uh, I'm never gonna listen to my ideas ever again after this, <laughs> I was a little bit green when it came, I'm like, I can do whatever, I'll stay in a hostel. So I picked this international hostel, so I land in Shanghai at midnight, no luggage, you know, phone, nothing. I get in a cab, I, I didn't know what to do, the, everything was shut down, so I got in a cab. I ended up, uh, a Chinese uh, man in a cab, drove me to this under the bridge, totally in the hood, of Shanghai, I, I'm looking for this place. He's pointing down a dark alley, so I walk up these stairs with this red light. International hostel scrawled on the, above the door. I walk up these stairs. All these Chinese guys are playing dice and smoking cigarettes in a room and a desk with a little bell. So, ding! I ring the bell. It's 1 a.m. You know, I'd been awake for 24 hours. Guy comes, gives me a little room. It's got a little fan and a little cot, and I'm trying to figure out where my a little gecko is visiting us in I the studio i think he is he is <laughs> hunking down for the hurricane too oh, I see him. it's right I there see him. that happens mm -hmm. a lot in florida mm -hmm. um so anyway long story short they say my luggage was back at the airport my flight leaves at 10 a.m from the other airport pudong across oh, town okay. so my plan was get in the cab go it's 4 a.m now get in the cab go back to the international airport get my luggage get back in another cab make my 10 a.m flight to jinajen i get to the airport at 7 a.m um, American Airlines is closed, and I missed my flight. Oh no! And I got stuck in Shanghai for a week <gasps> because I could not get out because the flight there was one flight going in and out, and there was bad weather. Oh so my, my luggage came in the next day, and it was it was unbelievable. I was exhausted. I remember sitting down on the floor. <sighs> you were awake for like three days in a row. Now I was awake for like 36 hours. I sat down on the floor. I was just like, I I don't know what to do. I'm in China <laughs> by myself. 
Um, I eventually figured out there's a hotel in the airport, which, duh, I should have done that. Yeah. Um, checked into that, fell asleep, woke up. My luggage came in the following day. I booked a flight to leave the next day for Gina Jen. That flight got canceled. So basically it was an Uma Thurman situation wandering around a foreign Asian town by myself oh, no. in Shanghai. And it ended up being really amazing. I saw some really amazing things. I met some really cool people. Um, and it was an adventure. And I ended up getting to Jinja Jen a week later. Now I get to Jinja Jen and their liaison picks me up at the small airport where I fly into. And I said, how many other residents are at the residency? And he said, um, none, you're the only one because we're paving the road, the dirt road going up the mountain. No cars can pass. Oh. And I was like, what? Super. I was in the most beautiful place in the world by myself. Well, I was with the family, which they only spoke Chinese nice. for six weeks. <laughs> and you communicated with images and sign language. They basically, it was like a National Geographic experience. I would, they would serve me three meals a day. I sat down with, it was like an authentic, I lived with a Chinese family for That's six awesome. weeks. In a, I mean, it was amazing. It was, I cried every day. I was like <laughs> so lonely. I didn't know what to do. Of course, I get there, I got super sick. I had uh, the beginnings of bronchitis. I had like fire lung, you know, and I was like, oh God, this is, um, this is how I die. <laughs> and um, In China. In China, on a hill, you know. And the place is, <laughs> in Sambao is beautiful. When it is activated, there's a restaurant, there's a bar, people are in and out. It's oh, very, cute. it's beautiful. There's a river that runs through it. They wash their dishes in the river. Oh, are we, are we out of time? Stop! No. Why'd you go like this? I'm like, you I, look so I get concerned. I get that we've got I over time. Do, like, I saw that we got minutes. over time. You your story's so I never, great. I, like, I you never, I never missed the time. But oh my god, I'm sorry. No, I'll wrap okay. it no, up. Finish, no, finish, you're, right. you're just, you know, you're so enticing. We've got to How do you call it enticing? Or you're like, your story is so good. Okay, it's a good story. It's a great story. So I'll just basically, long story short, I spent six weeks there with a Chinese family. And I developed the prototypes for the molds that produced my thesis show. Had awesome. a man That's make incredible. the molds. The thing is, there was no car, so I had to walk up and down a dirt road. It took two hours. I walked with those molds on my back, in the, in the mud, in the blown up road, war tone road, dogs stuck together, people in dirt houses looking at me You know, as I'm walking down the road, got them into a box, shipped them home. They arrived in August, just in time for my third year. I made more molds, and those are the molds I used to produce my thesis. That's super cool. So it was productive at the end of the day. Wow. You see, and you wanted to go like this and stop for I love it. Wow. <laughs> no, I, I usually I tell you Final like how question. many minutes. I, I, know. Like, I, I was know. like, I'm ignoring this. <laughs> Wow, it's that's I mean the background story to that show that's just you know that's that really like makes my hair stand. It almost so killed me. I'm not gonna lie, because <laughs> yeah. it took a long time for the molds to get made. It was almost I wasn't able to make any work. It took that whole back and forth to the printer and trying yeah. to get supplies. And the tough part was no cars going back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's up there on the mountain. So I was on dirt bikes and I was like holding on to this this young girl who was my helper. Thank God for her. She was my translator, and I was holding on to her. And I'm, you know, I'm six feet tall, and she's probably about five feet tall. And she's we're on this motorbike, and I'm holding her for dear life with a helmet on. We have masks on because it's so dusty, going down this dirt road, and you know, gripping onto this young girl. She was taking me back and forth, just unbelievable. Wow, what a story! That's why oh when you God. say Alaska, you live in an igloo. I was like, you know, I had that experience already. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's an actual center, but I don't know. I saw pictures, and I just picture an, an igloo in my mind. I would love to visit somewhere in the Arctic, I and will, I will. Okay, we'll talk. We'll talk after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a time. last question? Or should the we last go? question is the last question. All right. Oh, yeah. Brr, drum roll. <laughs> drum You're roll. sitting in a magical rocking chair, <laughs> and since you went through our little rocking chair session, it grants you three wishes. Yes. You can wish for anything you want. Anything. Anything. Number one. Wow. Number one. Um, I think I, I would love to be able to uh, live and breathe underwater. Ooh. What a world. Little Mermaid, <laughs> Kevin Cosner. <laughs> yes, Little with Mermaid. With him or without him? Little Mermaid. Not Little Mermaid specifically, but yeah, she was I mean, too angsty for me. But <laughs> And she sang all the time. But again, she sang. That's cool, but you know, it was yeah. annoying. So I, you probably, I probably have no friends except for maybe like a crab and a seagull. <laughs> Number two. Um, a wish that I would really love to have would be to be able to travel back in time and speak to my relatives when they were younger. Ooh. But they would not know it was me. Sort yeah. of like a... 
like a Marty situation in Back to the Future. Yes. I would, I love it. Without sort of existentially impacting my well-being. Mm -hmm. And in your existence. And yeah. I would love to speak to my grandmother and, and know what she was like, what was she, th she was thinking, and love to know my mother when she was my age and what she felt yeah, like. Yeah, Grandma Gwen, and see her working with the kiln and the slip, and your mom, oh, and to be an artist. She what was, was, she was a like? traveler, too, just a quick yes. segue. She was a dancer for the U.S. Army. She traveled to the Philippines <gasps> when she was 18, dancing for the troops. Amazing. So she was... So you had the performance in, in the blog from and her, the travel. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the travel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And number three... Um, Gosh, that would be tough. I guess another superpower, I'd love to be able to fly. Ooh. And just, because that's sort of like time travel. You'd be able to get from one place to another. And avoid really traffic, Miami traffic, mm -hmm. right? And fly, and avoid traffic. Yes. And I would love to feel like flying. I think mm -hmm. that the feeling be, of it. Like the wind. Look, I love looking at things from above. Ooh, have you ever jumped out of an airplane? As I a have not that? done that. And you know, I, I, for a while I wanted to do that, but I think I, I don't need that experience. I think I can get, get it just from looking down a high building. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is enough for me. I've had enough. After China, I'm kind of like, <laughs> I don't need to do any more death defying. You're so or, excited out, oh you know, you're like, gosh. you had so much excitement for the rest it's of just, uh, It's just, it's just, it hurts. You know, yeah. it's amazing, but it, hurt. it makes great stories, but it really does hurt while yeah. it's happening. I feel oh. like. Well, we're so grateful that you came out days before the hurricane hit. Thank you so um, much, Lauren. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah, safe journey too. to Boca Raton, correct? Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. I can't believe you pulled this off pre-hurricane. Well, we're excited that Lauren said yes. I, mean, I she's know. I owed you guys. Oh, you really helped us out. to come through here. Yeah. <laughs> Number 22 is down, and we're going to be back next week after everything is cleaned yes. up again, hopefully. Hopefully. With our next Fingers rocking crossed. chair session. Yes. All righty, guys. Bye, Bye. Thank you for listening in. Bye.